Lectures on the Basics of Biblical Greek Chapter 31 In this chapter, we'll take up the subjunctive mood. But before we do so, let's talk a bit about moods of the verb and moods we have previously learned, the indicative and the participle. The mood of a Greek verb points to its connection to reality. Greek has a number of moods. Indicative, subjunctive, optative, imperative, infinitive, participle. In the indicative mood, reality is claimed. An indicative verb makes a statement or asks a factual question. So far in Greek, we spent quite a bit of time on the indicative mood, uh, focusing on the various tenses and voices. This master verb chart is only part of the list that we have studied so far. With this second chart, we have the now complete list of the various tenses and voices of the indicative verb. The participial mood uh, points to verbal forms that function as verbal adjectives. That is, the form is built on a verb, it starts with an unaugmented tense stem, it adds a participle morpheme, which indicates that it is a participle, and the voice, and it finishes with a case ending. When a reader meets a participle, its function is analyzed through a series of questions. Is an article present? If so, the participle is adjectival. If not, the participle is most likely adverbial. If the participle is ad adjectival, a second question is asked. Is a noun present with which the participle agrees in case, gender, and number? If so, the participle functions like an attributive adjective. If not, the participle functions like a substantive, taking the place of a noun or pronoun. In the case where no article is present and the initial analysis is adverbial, Subsequent analysis will determine whether the participle functions as a circumstantial participle, giving the circumstances under which the primary verb takes place, whether it's a genitive absolute, that is an adverbial participle in the genitive along with a noun or pronoun in the genitive, whether it is paraphrastic, an adverbial participle uh, plus a form of a me, or if it's modifying an indefinite noun, in which case it could be adjectival. So the moods, indicative and participle, are the ones that we've addressed so far, the former dealing with claimed reality, and the latter describing a verb that acts as a verbal adjective. We now switch our attention to the subjunctive mood and will ask, what the subjunctive mood is, how it's formed, how it functions, and then look at some examples. First of all, what is the subjunctive mood? Unlike the indicative, which is claimed reality, the subjunctive describes what may or might be. The subjunctive is about possibility or probability, but not precise reality. We have a subjunctive form in English. If I were, I would is a subjunctive construction as opposed to an indicative construction which deals with reality. If it is, I will. So the subjunctive is about an unfulfilled and to a degree future event, but something that's only possible or probable, not necessarily reality. Working with the subjunctive in Greek, aspect is central. 
there will only be present and aorist subjunctives. No imperfect, no future, no perfect, just present and aorist. And so the distinction between present and aorist in terms of aspect becomes critical. A present subjunctive is generally continual. Were I to keep on praying, I would. But an aorist subjunctive is undefined. Were I praying, I would. Both sentences are indefinite. They talk about possible activity. When the present tense is used, that possible activity is ongoing. When the aorist tense is used, that possible activity is undefined. How is the subjunctive formed? Like the participle, the subjunctive uses unaugmented stems. So when the present stem is used, it'll look like the present stem. When the aorist stem is used, the augment will be gone. Because it's a non-augmented form, only the primary set of personal endings will be used. The key for identifying a subjunctive is the presence of a lengthened connecting vowel. Instead of omicron or epsilon, the connecting vowel is omega or eta. This is one of the key points in the identification of a subjunctive. The present subjunctive is formed by combining the present stem plus a connecting vowel, omega or eta, long connecting vowel, plus the primary active endings. In the first column, the three parts are shown in an exploded view. In the second column, those forms are condensed together to what actually appears. Please note, in the second person singular and the third person singular, the yoda of the indicative subscripts when there is a long connecting vowel eta. So the forms are leo, li ace, li a, li omen, li eta, li oc. The verb a me is such that when the connecting vowel is lengthened, it swallows up what remains of the stem, and so only the endings occur, connecting vowel and primary active endings. O, ace, a, omen, eta, osi. Notice smooth breathing marks to help distinguish some of these forms from the relative pronoun that we've seen previously. The present middle passive, subjunctive, is formed with the present stem, those long connecting vowels, and the primary middle passive endings. In the middle column, the three parts are quite visible in the exploded form. The right column compacts those forms together uh, so that you get what appears in Greek. The awkward form is the second person singular. In the second person singular, the three parts are li, a, and psi. A sigma standing between two long vowels drops out leaving eta, alpha, yoda. The eta and alpha contract to eta and the yoda subscripts, thus the form li a for the second singular subjunctive. The aorist active subjunctives are formed by using an unaugmented aorist active stem, a tense formative in the case of the first aorist, but none in the case of the second aorist, plus the lengthened vowel and the primary active endings, combinations with which we are already familiar. So the first aorist is li so, which looks like a future. However, in the other forms, the lengthened vowel clearly indicates its subjunctive. In the second aorist, the form is identical to the present, except for the use of an aorist stem. So, 
Labo is the aorist, second aorist subjunctive, first person singular. The aorist middle subjunctive is formed in a similar fashion, with an unaugmented aorist stem, a tense formative in the case of first aorists, none with the second aorists, the long connecting vowel and primary middle passive endings. So the first person singular first aorist subjunctive middle is lisomai. The first person singular second aorist subjunctive middle is genomai. In this particular case, it's a middle deponent. The aorist passive subjunctive is formed by using the unaugmented aorist passive stem, a tense formative for first aorists, none for the second, the long connecting vowels, and the unusual use of the primary active endings, even though the form is passive. So, litho for the first aorist passive subjunctive, and grapho for the second aorist passive subjunctive. Notice for these forms alone, uh, the accent is not recessive to the stem. Uh, it looks like one has added the present of a me to the um, stem and tense formative when necessary. Next, I'll show you the contract uh, active subjunctive, present, um, because I want to note a problem that arises. The combinations are quite obvious. Alpha plus the lengthened connecting vowel in a-o verbs. Uh, epsilon plus the lengthened connecting vowel in e-o uh, verbs. Omicron plus the connecting vowel in a-o words. The contractions follow. The forms marked in black here are forms that are identical, whether they are present indicative or present subjunctive. So some other indicator will be necessary to say whether agapo is first person singular present active indicative or first person singular present active subjunctive. The contract middle passive subjunctive in the present is so formed the same way as the active. That is, the stem vowel, alpha, epsilon, or omicron, combines with a lengthened connecting vowel and the middle passive endings of the primary set. That contraction um, yields a couple of anomalies. In agapao, the present middle passive subjunctives are identical to the present middle passive indicatives. That's only the case with the second person singular in poieo, but with the second singular of plerao, the second person singular present middle passive subjunctive is identical to the third person singular present active subjunctive and the third person singular present uh, uh, active indicative. So three forms are identical. Uh, again, other parts of the sentences are necessary. So play Roy can be a quite a problematic form. Fortunately, it occurs only rarely. Although the charts may seem at first to be overwhelming, it is the presence of that long connecting vowel that is so central to identifying the forms of the subjunctive. We turn now to the functions of the subjunctive, and here certain helping words will indicate to us that we are dealing with a subjunctive, and that can be very helpful with forms that are ambiguous. Although there are examples of subjunctive in English, the usage in Greek is much wider than in English. Subjunctives in Greek are used in certain independent clauses, such as the hortatory subjunctive and the deliberative sub subjunctive. And functions are used 
frequently in Greek in dependent clauses, such as purpose clauses, in order that, or certain conditional clauses. Let's look at a description of each and then an example or two of each. The hortatory subjunctive is identified by a subjunctive standing by itself in the main clause. There's no indicative verb. The, sub the subjunctive will be first person, either singular or plural. The form com conveys an exhortation, such as let me, that's first person singular, or let us, first person plural. Prosiukomatha, were it the main verb, subjunctive, notice the long connecting vowel, uh, and the first person plural ending, is translated, let us keep praying. The keep is added because it's a present subjunctive indicating ongoing action. The deliberative subjunctive. A second example of a subjunctive functioning as the main clause of a sentence, that is, as an independent clause, is a question with an uncertain answer, such as te fagomen. Notice it's subjunctive, long connecting vowel. It's a question. What shall we eat? Te omen. What shall we drink? The answer is uncertain. Therefore, the question is deliberative and done with the subjunctive. Other functions of the subjunctive show up in dependent clauses, clauses that are not the main clause of the sentence. For example, hina plus the subjunctive is a purpose clause. It means in order that. Hina may plus the subjunctive would then mean in order that not or lest. So in the sentence may crinete, hina may crithete, do not judge, lest you plural be judged. Aorist subjunctive passive. Conditional clauses are if-then clauses. The if part of a condition is called the protesis. The then part of a condition is called the apotesis. In Greek, there are four different classes of conditional clauses. Cla in class three, the protesis is an plus the subjunctive. So, in the example before you, the devil is tempting here, tautasoi panta doso, eon peson proskinesesmoi. I will give to you all these things if, falling down, you singular worship me. Notice that on plus the subjunctive. It's a conditional clause. But the fulfilling of the condition of the if part is uncertain. If you worship me. Well, as we know, Jesus didn't. But the temptation was that he might. Perhaps you've noticed that in Greek there are two words for negation, both of which mean no or not. No difference between them, except u is used to negate an indicative verb. May negates non-indicative verbs. We used may with participles, for example. But when you put the two negatives together, in English, two negatives make a positive. In Greek, two negatives make a stronger negative. U may plus the a subjunctive is a common way of making an emphatic negation. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, on me perisuse, 
unless your righteousness exceeds. That's a class three conditional with on plus a subjunctive. Then the apodosis, u me eis el theta, eis tain basileon, tone uranon. You will absolutely not enter into the kingdom of the heavens. So, the subjunctive is fairly easy to identify by the lengthened connecting vowel, although there are some ambiguous forms. Then, other words help in clarifying that a word is subjunctive, such as no augment in aorist forms, the appearance of hinna, which is almost always followed by the subjunctive, or combinations with on and a particle that makes a sentence indefinite. If it's indefinite, it's not claimed reality, it's only possibility or probability. So it gets the subjunctive verb. So, such forms as hotan, whenever, e'an, if ever, hasan, whoever, hapu'an, wherever, he'os'an, until when, these kind of forms almost always followed by subjunctives because they are not claimed reality but possible realities. We did mention um, negation a bit ago. Here is perhaps then an appropriate time to bring up asking questions in Greek because it's a little different from English. An indicative plus a question mark in England in Greek indicates that there is no expected answer. The answer could be yes, it could be no. The answer is certain, otherwise one would use the deliberative subjunctive, but the author doesn't give a hint as to the answer. However, if a question begins with ooh, the author of the question expects an affirmative answer. For example, Consider the cry of the disciples while Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat during a storm. Doesn't it matter to you that we are perishing? Umele soy, hoti, apalumatha? Doesn't it matter? Well, of course it matters. An affirmative answer is expected. But when a question begins with may, a negative answer is expected. May pontus prophetai? Are all people prophets? Of course they're not. U in a question? An affirmative answer is expected. May in a question? A negative answer is expected. Lastly, let's look at four examples. Each one will illustrate one of the subjunctive functions about which we have just spoken. Agomen, idu, engiken ha paradidusme. Notice the long vowel in agomen. It's hortatory subjunctive. Jesus says to his disciples at Gethsemane, let us be going. Behold, my betrayer is at hand. Ti poieso, hoti uk echo pu sinaxo tus carpusmu. From the parable of the rich fool, a deliberative subjunctive. Notice ti poieso in a question, main clause. What should I do? Since I do not have a place where I might put my fruits. Epitimesen autois hina me deni legosin peri autu. Hina plus a subjunctive is a subjunctive of purpose, a purpose clause. He rebuked them in order that they might tell no one concerning him. Aonme 
tis genethe, exhidatos kai pneumatos, udinatai, ex elthain ace tain basileon tu theu. Aon, plus in this case an aorist passive subjunctive, uh, is a class three conditional. Unless someone has been born from water and the spirit, it's not certain, possibility, unless someone has been born from water and the spirit, one is not able to enter into the kingdom of God. In this lesson, we have explored the subjunctive mood, the mood of possibility and probability. We've looked at its forms in the present and aorist. Key for identifying those forms is the long connecting vowel. We've talked about the fu functions of the subjunctive, at least the ones we've looked at so far, hortatory, deliberative, purpose, and conditional. And we've explored some examples. It's now time to work with the material, ask some questions, and translate, translate, translate.